Hello and welcome to round two coverage of Grand Prix Detroit. Brian David Marshall here in the booth with Eduardo Sajglik. And we are watching Reed Duke chasing down three pro points to tie Seth Manfield for the lead in the player of the year race. He's playing up against David Tortenson. And uh, this is going to be basically an Obzon-ish mirror. Yeah, I mean, I mean I, I'm mean, i going to look uh, throughout the match at the difference between differences between both decks. I won't go too much now into it uh, to let you enjoy uh, kind of like what the positioning is going to be here. And, and Reed here with the Inquisition gets the news. This is the mirror match. Um, with David already having what I view as the most important card in this matchup, Lingering Souls. Uh, both players play a full set of Liliana of the Veil. So, so, you know, it's a powerful card in Modern, but in a matchup like this, once one player fires Lingering Souls, Lingering of the Veil is very bad against both sides of Lingering Souls. So, uh, yeah. Grim Flare, Abrupt Decay, Fatal Push, Lingering Souls, and a Thoughtseize in hand for Tortenson and the Grim Flare. Get out of here. Right. So, Reed sees a lot of different answers, um, so decides here to take the Grim Flare. Even if Reed's hand had quite a bit of removal, it doesn't really make too much sense to leave the Grim Flare. You kind of want to run uh, David out of answers unless... You have a fret of your own that can take over. <laughs> but between the discard spell, the abrupt decay, it's unlikely that Reed would have a fret that would survive. All right, well, you're going to see David Tortenson fire off this Thoughtseize, I believe. Goes uh, Marsh Flats into, underground, into Overgrown Tomb. <laughs> and uh, Reed just immediately shows him his hand, says, okay, what do you want, Murderous Cut or any of these four lands? This hand is actually, it looks really bad, but it's actually a really powerful hand that Reed has access to. Yeah, double Treetop Village yeah. uh, and uh, two other green sources. Right, Treetop Village, perfect against Abrupt Decay. Great against Lingering Souls tokens. The fact that it has Trample allowing you to deal damage, and that means that Reed essentially gets to put pressure on with David needing answers. Since, well, yeah, only that fatal push is going to be an answer. Uh, Reed does know about the push, I believe, here, though, so he probably will not attack this turn. Yep, Nihil Spellbomb was the play from Tortenson. There you get a look. Just going to use it probably to, just to cycle here. Right. Oh. It, it's, it's, Although you, you see know. some Delve cards in, in, in Reed Duke's uh, graveyard there in the Murderous Cut, so, you know, could, could have some utility. Right, like, graveyards are an integral part of a lot of the decks in Modern, and uh, both... And essentially in the Sabzan mirror, you, you'll notice that both players play the card Grim Flayer. Um, actually, uh, Reed deciding to play also Tarmogoyf as the main one. So the idea of Nihil Spellbomb is it's a way to give an additional uh, card type for Tarmogoyf and Grim Flayer while uh, having a card that cycles and has utility. So Nihil Spellbomb essentially attacking on those angles. And you don't want to remove your graveyard that a Relic of Progenitus would do, and that's why you play Nihil Spellbomb. Um, Interestingly, David did not sacrifice the Nihil Spellbomb to draw a card. Uh, and considering a land drop was missed, that, might, that maybe should have been the direction to go. Yeah, st stuck on two lands here while uh, Reed Duke is, is summoning a uh, creature land army slowly. He's got two uh, treetop villages in play. This is kind of a strange sequence of events. I believe David has a Dark Confidence in hand. And also didn't make the second land drop. All right, well, there's his third land, fifth land for Reed Duke. I mean, Reed is the Godless Shrine tapped. Yeah, I, I think the approach from David here is I have way more spells than uh, Reed. So my, ang so my angle is going to be as long as I can answer one of these creature lands, I can't go too low on life and I'll ride Dark Confidant or Lingering Souls to victory. But Reed has access to free creature lands. So um, I don't think this plan would pen out. I would have liked to see David play Dark Confidant last turn or sacrifice Nihil Spellbomb to draw a card. Yeah, there's that one shambling vent over there as well for uh, for Reed. Yeah, Creature Land's great um, in a matchup like this where you're essentially a Tireless Tracker and also oh, amazing wow. card. wow. Tireless Tracker was a draw for Reed Duke. Plays his six land, a windswept heath. He's going to get a clue. Yeah, and here David's in a hard place where you need to remove the Tireless Tracker, so Reed is going to respond to the removal spell by sacrificing Windswept Teeth. Essentially netting another clue. So Tireless Tracker adding as discard... Uh, it's a very slow version of Divination discard uh, <coughs> removal spell, but it's essentially what we're going to see as Reed is a little flooded out. 
And, and this is why I kind of dislike David taking it too slow. Re can top deck. And you, need, you do need to have board presence. Otherwise, you can't leverage your cards. If you are low on mana and are passing every turn, you can't leverage your mana effectively. So you're going to fall further and further behind. Here you see Tortenson. He uh, yeah, sacrificed his land, got his revolt trigger so that he was able to uh, kill the tireless tracker here with Fatal Push. But Reed does get to respond, sacrifice the land, get a second clue, and he's going to put himself in a great position here to uh, dig for cards uh, and leverage all this mana he has in play. Right, exactly. I'm kind of also surprised David decided to use the Fiddle Push rather than the Abrupt Decay, since the Abrupt Decay can't hit those, cre uh, those creature lands. Yeah. All right, land starting to flow now for David Tortenson. Looks like he drew a Swamp. Yeah. And, I, I mean, we, we need to cast something here. We can't just stay with cards in hand. Right, oh, Lingering okay. Souls here. He's going to make himself two Spirit Tokens. Yeah, I, I feel like... David just decided, just fell way too far behind, um, scared of an attack rather than trying to deploy Dark Confidant. Dark Confidant would have been a way to try to come back into the game and have a board presence. So I think that's a little too late. Uh, Reed can easily attack here with uh, Treetop Village, and he can even fought sees here to clear the path. And that's what he's going to do. He sees Liliana of the Vale, Dark Confidant, and Abrupt Decay. I believe Liliana is the only card he wasn't aware of in that hand. Let's see. Um, with your opponent on four lands, but most likely sacrificing Nighthill Spell Bomb. Uh, so that means that you're going to have access to Lingering Souls plus a two drop, but Abrupt Decay isn't something that you're worried about. Okay. okay. If Reed takes Abrupt Decay, then Reed has a threat to deploy, most likely. We see him tapping two, ma two mana. He's going to get his Treetop Village activated. And into the red zone. Yep. Has more land. And there's Liliana, the last hope. This is a card we saw a ton of in Legacy last week in Eduardo. Yeah, definitely. Uh, We're back to basics card of the tournament for sure. Yeah. And uh, it's even the same one. It has that same 87 <laughs> stamp that I recognize. But yeah, uh, that's why Reed took the above the K, obviously. Liliana last. While Lilian of the Veil is a relatively weak card in a matchup like this, and, and usually will get shaved post sideboard. Linear the Last Hope is probably one of, if not the best card you can have for these mirrors. Extremely hard to deal with. Always gets rid of uh, Souls tokens as a bonus. Keeps sticking up. Means your opponent can't race. It's just an amazing uh, card in a matchup like this. And I wouldn't be shocked if Reed had kept the Liliana, the Last Hope in hand, knowing about the Above Decay, waiting to draw a discard spell to take Above Decay and, sl and play the Liliana. All right, well, now David is able to deploy a flashback Lingering Souls and a Dark Confidant to the board. Plenty of targets for Liliana to uh, feast upon. Right, but uh, th it's the right approach. You, you know that Liliana is going to essentially get something anyways, so you might as well flood the board to try to, to get to Liliana. But yeah, here, uh, Reed gets to put pressure on two fronts. Reed is forcing David to attack that Liliana, the last hope, but at the same time, is also attacking uh, David's life total with treetop villages. Oh, there you see two treetop villages getting into the red zone. That's six points of trample damage. Yeah, and, and Reed has access to lingering souls in hand. Oh, whoa. Oh, wow. Yeah. Slaughter pact. <laughs> yeah. Free spell. Just remember, remember to pay your upkeep. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more on the, the Kenji uh, Tsumura line of of thinking, which I, is remind your opponent to pay for packs. I'm sure Reed will as well. It's harder in a team tournament, but yeah, I think those players would be more akin to, to remind you. All right, there you see, he does remember to pay. Yeah. So you're wondering why he's paying. Slaughter Pact, yeah, zero mana removal spell, but requires you to pay for what it is later, i.k.a. Dark Banishing, which costs two and black. Um, but yeah, Reed here um, wouldn't have expected Slaughter Pact at all. Like, that, that is a total surprise. Uh, but definitely took the right angle by attacking with those two treetop villages since it was most likely going to put David to four and two treetops would have ended the game. So now Reed is in a different position, but Reed can still ride card advantage to victory. Liliana the Last Hope, uh, that clue in play. Plus, I believe Reed's own Lingering Souls mean that Reed will be able to retake this board. Reed just attacked with two treetop villages over the point Lingering Souls because his, uh, David was tapped out. And you wouldn't expect something like Slaughter Pact in a position like this. All right, Torrenson sends the Spirits at Liliana. And uh, 
Reed sacrifices his Marsh Flats in response. And he's got an abrupt decay. Yeah, abrupt. And he's, yeah. he's going to use that on a token. Just gives you an idea of how valuable that Liliana is. And now David can't actually win the race against those uh, against Liliana with those spirit tokens. Right. It, even if it looks like a bad exchange, right? Abrupt decay for quarter of a card. The fact is, Liliana last hope gets to survive, and no matter what, you get to take over the game. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> meanwhile, oh, and it, I mean, uh, Reed is just going to attack with his two lands. Now, finally, Tortensen's going to sacrifice that spell bomb, cycle for a card. But yeah, dealing he's the damage. He's going to fall to two. Yeah. Liliana ticks up and picks off another spirit. Yeah, two lands, Liliana the Veil. Let's go. Game wow. two. But yeah, I feel David played this game far too passively, and Reed got to cap capitalize on it with the creature lands, you know, being able to put pressure. It was actually a really, it was an impressive hand for a match like this. Um, there's a lot of matchups in Modern where that hand would not have been able to do much. I mean, you got a creature removal spell and you got a discard spell, so it wasn't so bad. But, yeah. Uh, by the way, you can see across the board, uh, everybody on Peach Garden Oath up a game. Uh, Owen Turtenwald up a game in this Tron Mirror. Uh, William Jensen up a game with Storm. Yeah, it looks like both players mulligan. Um... Uh, Is that, I'm trying to see what the card, there's a Nulamog, uh, the Ceaseless Hunger. I believe the other card is either Worm Coil Engine or Fodnot Seer. <laughs> um, unless it's something even stranger. These colorless cards sometimes resemble themselves. Oh, wow, is that? Okay, so we got, that. I believe that's Urza's Mind, Tower, and Power Plant in hand for uh, Owen Turnwald. Natural turn free Tron is potentially online. All right, well. Charles is giving him a run here. All right, both players uh, part of the way there, two-thirds of the way there. Yeah, Charles here sacrificing the sphere on end step uh, to increase the chances of drawing that for a Tron, Tron piece, but I probably would have sacrificed it. If your plan was to sacrifice it on end step, I would have been more um, inclined to do it on your own turn. Well, there's a thought not here. He's completed the Tron. Yeah, I mean, here a uh, Karn liberated would have been game over. So yeah, okay, it was uh, thought not here, but yeah. So ancient stirrings, thought not here, three lands, and Ulamog, the ceaseless hunger, so hungry. Yeah, taking the other thought not here. Um, the th the thing with thought not here is it's a really good post cyborg card. For oh, sorry, that's not ancient stirrings. That's uh, nature's claim. That's nature's claim. Yeah, yeah. 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 But uh, yeah, the thought not here is a really good semi-transformational uh, aspect for the Tron decks because a lot of the decks that try to fight Tron do so with cards like Damping Sphere or other types of land destruction. And Fodnot Seer costing four mana allows you to put a mid-range threat in play that buys you time and disrupts your opponent. Right. So it hits on a lot of different axes. So that's why it's been such a popular inclusion. But yeah, Owen with Tron and with Ulamog in hand. So my, my guess is that Charles left that Ulamog with the mindset that oh, I, I have something for that. Um, also, we're just worth noting those thought, thought not seers from both players coming in out of the sideboard. Right, yes. Yeah. The, the, Which you were implying, but just clarifying. Yes. All right, here's an Ancient Stirrings for Cap. He gets to go digging. This is where I sigh loudly when I'm actually playing a game <laughs> of Ancient Stirrings. I mean, right, it's your payoff card, right? Like, you're, you're choosing to play a colorless deck, and you get a pay... Wait, I said a payoff card. Did we see what the card was? Was there a card? I don't think I've seen. I think I've seen that card fail once. <laughs> once, like I think I've literally seen that card only fail once in modern before. No. no. Oh, there's Karn liberated, and he is going to go at Owen's uh, Urzatron. Exiles one of the lands. Oh, Owen's like, no big deal. <laughs> no big uh, deal. <laughs> I got my I've, own. I've got my own Karn. Yeah, and here, I mean, Owen had the tower, so um, we're going to see some mortal Karn bat here. Oh, my. <laughs> oh, my Lord. Why is everyone looking at me? <laughs> I, I mean, it's a pretty one-sided fight. One of them just says, finish him, and that's <laughs> it. But, yeah, here, Owen, I mean, Owen obviously has to play the Karn. There's no other 
real play. So the question is, what do you do with it? Um, I think the win would fall too far behind if the card in front gets to take a land, but because of that Fodnoth Seer. If, if it was just card versus card, then it becomes a closer debate. Right. But with Fodnoth Seer in play, you know that Karn cannot plus because your opponent can just minus theirs. Um, yeah. Wow, he takes the Thought Knot Seer instead of the Karn. Wow. And then Owen gets to draw a card when, Karn, when the Thought Knot Seer leaves play. Yeah. Owen recognizing that with a lack of action. Okay, so that, that was a really interesting uh, line here. Owen recognizes with the lack of action in hand because Wulomog, the Ceaseless Hunter, costing 10, is going to be too hard to get to. So Owen goes, I really need to draw cards. Um, I'm going to force my opponent in a position to choose between my land or my Karn Liberated. So it's very likely my opponent has to take this Karn Liberated down. So I get, I get to keep my, my Urzatron. If I keep my Urzatron, then what do I want? I want cards. So yeah, so Charles here deciding to take the, the Urza land. Now you, the cards are just still exiled forever. But there you see Karn takes, takes down Latron. But he's going to need to find something to pressure this Karn from... Oh, and oh, how about Ugin the Spirit Dragon? Ugin the Spirit Dragon wow. is going to ghost fire Karn Liberated. Wow, this is, I mean, that's a real Planeswalker fight here. You know, one of the problems often when you play Planeswalkers is that they don't always interact well with each other. But Ugin is able to just go straight at Karn's giant dome here. It's kind of funny how basically all these Planeswalkers have a mode which says destroy target walker in, the, in a match like this. Since it's very rare that Karn would tick up since uh, you want to deal with your opponent's board almost always overtaking a card in hand. So Ugin can counter a card at free, as you saw. A card can counter an Ugin. It's basically who has the last <laughs> walker standing. Well, Owen casts, uh, plays a forest, goes Sylvan Scrying, completes his Tron for the third time this game. Right, the tower keeps on coming back. Um, but yeah, um, Ugin the Spirit Dragon may not look like that great a card in the mirror match, uh, but you're really just looking for ways to disrupt your opponent and haymakers. So Ugin is fine in that context. It's not like the most powerful card you have access to in the matchup. Um, I think it's okay to have it. Urza's Factory came on top. Uh, there was a lot of great, but essentially Urza's Factory with the full Urza gets to produce a 2-2 assembly worker. Um, yeah, that should be at 11, right? It was plus, it's plus two on Ugin the Spirit Dragon, if I recall. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and, Owen, and Owen saw that, too. Right. <laughs> he saw him just correct his opponent. Yeah, the magical number on Ugin the Spirit Dragon is 10. One, it's not that long to get to, essentially, Ugin the Spirit Dragon's ultimate ability. And once you do in a match like this, having plus 7 permanence probably locks your opponent out of the game. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, because you may not have seen Ugin the Spirit Dragon's ultimate enough, it's just draws. It's the reverse of Nicol Bolas's ultimate. Uh, Nicol Bolas Planeswalker, sorry, ultimate. All right, so Ancient Stirrings is going to lead things off here for Owen, and that's going to get uh, Warping Weld. Yeah, Warping Weld. Uh, there's a lot of sorceries in these Tron decks, and being able to counter a Stirrings or Scrines at a key moment is very powerful. Warping Whale seen kind of universal play in all the Tron decks just because of the versatility, right? The fact that you can get a sorcery or exile, say, mana creatures. Really, you get to choose what you want to do. Plus, then Monon and putting a Scion and just kind of having a suspend one Lotus Petal, so to speak. You know, it takes a turn. <laughs> totally fine because it's like sometimes you just need one additional mana to, f to get a Karn in play or a Nugan. All right, so you see Cap makes a 2-2 two -two at the end of the turn. Gets in there. I have never actually seen that token. <laughs> <laughs> but it is an assembly worker. It is the right one. Oh, oh wow. and now another Karn liberated. Yeah, I, I mean, at this point. Uh, wow, yeah, this is. We're, we're done. I mean, yeah, we're, we're done. Like, Charles is about to. Charles probably should have drawn the seven cards first, I guess, since you could have put Karn in play with the ability. But you know, there's there's um, there's no wrong way to eat this uh, <laughs> this, this sweet treat. Yeah, here you see him 
Is he looking for a number that doesn't exist on the die? <laughs> oh, okay. It does exist. Oh, so he was looking for 13. So he's content to just keep uh, firing away at uh, Owen's life total here. It's probably not necessary. I mean, we're going to get there anyways. I, I, I just can't resist, or resist the allure of drawing the, the equivalent of seven cards and having tons of mana. So we're probably going to see it at some point because we're going to spare dragons a hero. <laughs> Now, he just does it again. I mean, uh, by taking this line, if Charles doesn't remove one, uh, doesn't remove Owen's tower, Owen could top deck a power plant or a way to find one. Uh, here's walking ballista. That should be and good that enough. should be good enough. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. We're gonna get a game three here between Owen and Charles Cap. But yeah, here, uh, essentially, first mover advantage, gets Urzatron first, removes the piece first. You can see, like, if the, the roles were reversed, Owen would have been able to fought Knots here first, uh, taking the key card, and then been able to deploy that Ulamog to Ceaseless Hunger, most likely, and take over the game. That wasn't what occurred. Both players drawing pretty good hands, you know, with Natural Tron. All right, now we're going to look in on table B here. William Jensen uh, playing Storm against... Steve Morrison playing Jeskai Control. We see a Baral uh, Chief of Compliance in play here. Yeah, uh, that Baral in play, I mean, it's much more likely post board since the uh, Jeskai deck will most likely board out, you know, some removal spells like Path to Exile and Lightning Helix. You would still keep in Lightning Bolt just because it kills Electromancer, it kills Baral Chief of Compliance at one mana, very efficient. Um, here, uh, you're gonna, both players with the card to spell being one of their key ones. Uh, for, you know, just, just a way for Huey to push through. Wow, look at this. One mana to play Manamorphose. You get to go up a mana here. I mean, Draw a card. Yeah. One of the key interactions of this deck, right? The fact that you have these creatures that discount your spells by your instants and sorceries by one mana, and then, yeah, just getting to go turn this into a mini ritual, drawing a card. A lot of advantage, and, and you can just do this little incremental advantage not going off, but just planning out your turn and eventually building up your graveyard, forcing kind of a past in flames, your opponent's forced to respond, and you might do something else on top. Here you see Steve keeping track of his opponent's mana for him. Now a pyretic ritual. And again, that becomes a true ritual here in the sense of costs one and you get three. A ritual printed in alpha, was that the reference we're working Yes, yeah, dark ritual. But yeah, uh, Huey has access to Gifts Ungiven in hand uh, that I saw pretty clearly, as well as Remand. Well, it looks like we're going to get a Cryptic Command uh, countering the Pyretic Ritual and returning Baral to hand. I mean, there's kind of two ways to approach this. Uh, and Huey's going to think about them both. The first way is you go, okay and then just return Baral. You, you've essentially traded Pyretic Ritual for Cryptic Command, which is a totally fine exchange. That is an acceptable rate. You're trading one of the cards that is kind of your engine piece for one of their disruption ones. Uh, because you could just let it this resolve and replay Baral in this position. Um, the other thing is Huey could go, actually, I can go off now. And Huey has access to Reman and Gifts Ungiven and can really, and here can decide, do I want to reman my own Pyretic Ritual, <laughs> you know, or, or the Cryptic Command, you, you know, by, by remanding the Pyretic Ritual, it depends on what the targets are here. It, it probably is Baral and Pyretic, as you pointed out, which means that remand is more likely going to target Cryptic. But with um, Huey having access to both remand and Gifts Ungiven, you can kind of do both of those first. Let the, the Baral come back to your hand, recast it, because you're, you're unleashing a flurry of instants in the meantime before your Baral comes back to your hand. And yeah, this is a kind of complicated sequence. I've, I've kind of like hopefully for, for the people at home explained what the thought process is here. I, I just want to see what uh, Huey decides on since he will have right, come to a He's going to use the blue in his mana pool rather than tap a land. He's going to he's going to cast Remand on his Pyretic Ritual. Yeah, and he gets to, this is kind of nice. 
because you counter a spell with Baral, it doesn't matter whether it was your spell or your opponent's, you still get to draw a card. I discard one, right? Baral's ability allow you to filter your hand. So it's going to draw a card for Remand. Going to draw a card and discard a card for Baral. Right. The Remand has to resolve first for the spell to be countered, and then you uh, draw a card. Yeah, so. Yeah, with Cryptic still on the stack. Yeah, this Cryptic is going to stay on the <laughs> stack for a little while. Steam Vents is going to get sacrificed. I mean, um, Scalding Tarn is going to get sacrificed for a mountain. I, I like that Huey decided to go for the Fetchland version of Storm rather than the straight up duels. Um, I think someone did a statistical analysis of which version is better, and it ended up that the Fetchland version was slightly better because of the mass amounts of card filtering that would occur. You see that purple die? That's keeping track of how many spells have been cast this turn. Five of them. Three red mana in pool. Taps an island for a blue. Maybe not. It's going to replay Baral. Has a land drop for the turn. Plays the Steam Vents. Red. Oh, wow. And he's going to go with Empty the Warrens, a sideboard card. Sort of a, a, a way to sort of storm off small. You don't have to just kill your opponent. Yeah, right. Uh, Empty the Warrens is good in situations like this where you do small bits of spells, right? Like each player like dispels something and then you have a second ritual. And that's like five storm and then you can just cast an empty for six. You don't need to lethal your, do lethal damage. I believe this was an empty for seven. I think that's 14 goblins. Yeah, and that's going to be very close to lethal. Yeah, Steven really needs a engineered explosives, which, which the Jeskai decks tend to board in and keep just because of that threat of Empty the Warrens. Wow, or a supreme verdict. So he was clearly uh, tuned in to this empty the Warrens plan because you don't really see more than a Baral game one in terms of creatures I mean, and the Goblin Electromancer out of this Storm deck. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a song and dance as to whether you decide to have supreme verdict while we see one of the most complicated cards to resolve in modern hit the stack and give some <laughs> given. Uh, but yeah, supreme verdict here, interesting decision as to whether to keep it or not. And, it, and there's no right answer. It really actually just depends on the build of your deck. If you have like a lot of ex engineered explosives and other ways to deal with goblins, like say in anger, then it's less relevant. But yeah, Pyromancer's Ascension is a blast from the past, though. Yep. You see Pyromancer Ascension and Gifts Ungiven go to the yard, and two uh, deck filtering spells go to hand for William Jensen. Right, and uh, he went for kind of a um, card value perspective. He just wants to transform gifts and given into a way to filter and draw cards, knowing that ascension or gifts will not be given. Oh Actually, boy. Yeah. it Steven? looks like we're going to see rest in peace here, and uh, that's going to say bye bye graveyards. Actually, I think I think Stephen had access to that rest in peace, so I probably would have just left Huey with the Pyromancer's ascension, since it does literally nothing oh, like under uh, rest in peace if you don't have the two. Uh, counters already. They're sliding by. A, a very aptly, ironically named card for William Jensen uh, in hand, Past in Flames. <laughs> With that rest in peace, his past uh, has been, all of his work this game has been obliterated. Yeah, it's, even even with the repeal, and yeah, you can see an empty the Warrens for two, but uh, just for four goblins, but even yeah. a repeal here on Rest in Peace, the damage is already done. That graveyard is gone. It's not like repealing the Rest in Peace allows you to have those cards back. I feel like I've played this cube match before. This cube match? <laughs> yeah. Electrolyze takes down two of the four goblins, draws a card for Steve Morrison. Wasn't that Modern Masters 1 limited? I think both of those cards were there. Yeah. And here's five mana. Here's Teferi, Hero of Dominaria. Yeah, these goblins are going to have to do a lot of work to get through this Teferi. <laughs> I mean, draws breakout card. card, yeah. Wow. Breakout card of Modern. I mean... The card was is very powerful, right? Like we knew it was going to be powerful and standard. I don't. I, I think everybody understood that that was going to occur. The fact is that because Teferi is essentially a free mana planeswalker, right? You played for five mana, but then you untap two lands, so essentially only costs you free mana. Then at that point, well, 
you realize it's really easy to protect. I have access to cards like Path to Exile, Lightning Bolt, and the latter. So I that so why don't I just play this to fairy? Like it's it's similar to like Liliana of the Veil in the Absent Dex. It's just that you can't play it on turn three. Although I would argue that not being able to jam to fairy on turn three sometimes is a play advantage. It reminds you you don't want to play this until you can protect it. All right, two goblins go at Teferi. Make a little dent. Uh, meanwhile, speaking of dents, uh, Reed Duke uh, gets uh, part of the way there for his team. Gets he the, wins yeah. Uh, yeah, his match 2 nothing over David Tortenson in that uh, Obzon Mirror. Yeah, the biggest death dents, an actual game win. Lightning Helix is going to take out the Baral. Be really curious to see how this game goes in game three in terms of sideboarding. It seems like... Steven just left in all his uh, creature removal. Yeah, but there's not that much that Huey can do to outside board uh, Steven here. Blood Moon is probably your best bet against these Jeskai decks, and that's why you would see a basic planes and island. We did jump into the game, but that basic those basics were probably fetched early to prevent an early Blood Moon. But there's not much that Huey can put in outside of Empty the Warrens and Blood Moon and Dispel. Those are the cards that matter in the matchup. Here you see an engineered explosives. For one. For one. I'm okay. I am actually okay. That may be a misplay here. Or I, I mean, th there's no cards that kills in Huey's deck. <laughs> like, th th it doesn't destroy anything. <laughs> yep, you see the two goblins coming at the ferry now. Yeah, that, that explosive should have been for, for zero here. And, yep. Oh, okay. Okay, we, we, we get the news here. Uh, that was, as you pointed out, probably not the most optimal line. It's okay. You learn that in track. You only make that mistake once. Yep. One would hope. Yeah, I, when, when I play games, I try... When I, you know, making mistakes is fine. It's part of the game. Yes. The key is not making them the same mistake multiple times. Well, here comes the Snapcaster Mage. Yeah, the, the usually popular Rest in Peace Snapcaster Mage sideboard plants. <laughs> A Braid is going to take down the Snapcaster, and Teferi's going to fall to two, so we're seeing a little bit of a, a little bit of headway here. I'm kind of surprised that Huey is playing Shattering Spree. It's been in his hand for a while, and there's only really engineered explosives that it would get. So I feel like both players... I don't, I don't, I don't know here. I, I don't think you need shatter, <laughs> Shattering Spree to get rid of engineered explosives. The Abraid has a little more utility. At least you can kill um, a Snapcaster Mage. Huey doesn't know about this. Steven actually has the spell quo. That would be the perfect target for an Abraid or a Vendillion Cleek. So I feel like the Abraid board in is fine. Not amazing, but it's acceptable. Uh, although Lightning Bolt to get rid of a Planeswalker may be better. That, that's like a debatable angle. But I think Shattering Spree is probably trying to put too many cards in. Like, just keep in combo pieces at that point. It's, it's okay to have that additional ritual in your hand or deck. All right, Field of Ruin there from Morrison. I mean, we use, it, we use the Field of Ruin now simply because uh, Teferi will untap those lands. Yep. Well, I got more lands. I'm good. Yeah, I mean, I mean, these storm decks with fetches tend to play quite a few basics. It's, you can't really play Blood Moon and not a, a healthy number of basics. It's pretty tough. Uh, interestingly, you might have noticed that snow-covered island right up there. Um, that's playing these uh, s storm decks just because sometimes, very rarely, you want to get a bunch of lands out of your deck. And snow-covered snow -covered island is not the same name as island. So right. when you do Gifts and Given, you choose four cards with different names. One of those can be island and the other snow-covered island. The fact that they're both basically the same card doesn't really matter. All right. Here you see... We got to ferry down to one, and a Goblin Electromancer is going to join the team. I mean, yeah, if that if that explosives for one not popping these goblins may have been a, a real problem. It, it's certainly given William Jensen a window he can wriggle through. It's a very tiny window, though. Yeah. Yeah, the additional cards are really important, but it seems like Steven has drawn counter magic, which is very good against the combo portion. But we've got that under control <laughs> with Rest in Peace, so... What Steven really wants is 
more board presence or something, essentially either dealing with Huey's board or uh, boosting, bolstering his own. But it doesn't seem like we have access to that here. We're going to see the Field of Ruin play again. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, I, I'm just checking the list. I think that was the last basic last turn. Okay. So he has achieved uh, strip mine status on his Field of Ruins. Wait, yeah, the, the better wasteland? Yeah. You get to keep the land as well. But yeah, Steven needs to dig to some way to control this board. Losing to Fairy here would be quite a blow, since it doesn't look like much damage to turn at four, but it is enough. Especially because Snapcaster Mage is just a 2-1 and, and will just trade. So at that point, you, you need something to really control the board. And if, if your plan is to put all these answers, then maybe what these paths should have been replaced with a card like Elspeth Sun Champion or Bane Slayer Angel if you have enough permanent disruption, such as Rest in Peace. All right. Here we go. Is this the turn to Fairy Falls? Maybe. Yep. The hero is down. Hero down. Hero down. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, that explosives for one earlier was probably not what Steven had in mind. And yeah, here it's punishing Steven pretty hard. Losing the Teferi and basically that source of continuous card advantage. But he may, it looks like, boy, the way he's lining up his mana, I feel like there may be a new hero on the horizon. <laughs> More heroes. <laughs> yep, it looks like a new hero. All that hard work to kill the first Teferi. This one's going to go right up to... Tick right up. Yeah, and two important draws from Steven this turn. The Lightning Bolt, um, quite key in um, alleviating some of this pressure by being able to kill a Goblin Electromancer. And I think Steven also drew a Celestial Colonnade. Oh, there it is. It's a good blocker. The fact is, when uh, Huey attacks, you can just use it since... With Rest in Peace, you're not too afraid of Huey's ability to combo off. But it's kind of nice. I, I think this game does exemplify one of the nicer parts of these post-board games between, you know, a combo deck like Storm and a control deck like Jeskai. It no longer becomes just about stopping the combo. It's about how each player can jockey themselves into a position where their opponents can't come back. Because Huey could still combo off. That is still an option available. Okay, so an attempt to repeal... The rest in peace gets dispelled. Yeah, I mean, the premium card you want to counter with that dispel is usually Gifts Ungiven, but countering repeal here is totally acceptable and means that Huey with Goblin Electromancer cannot leverage into comboing off. I would probably have fired off the Lightning Bolt, though. I, I guess Steven has access to Negate, so you can do it on upkeep. Just going to do it right here. The advantage of doing it at end of turn is you're not building storm up. So if uh, Huey has access to another empty the warrens, you're not putting yourself in a dangerous position. Yeah. And, and since uh, Steven is ahead, I actually like the end of turn uh, killing here. Just you know, you don't want to you want to take zero risks when you're when you're ahead like this. If you're if you're dispel if you are lightning bolting on upkeep and then your opponent gets two more goblins, that's just a disaster scenario. And Steven's hand seems loaded with cap counter magic and, and He's just gonna bad play ambush vipers. Sorcery <laughs> speed, Snapcaster Mage, so he can untap his mana. I, I mean, Snapcaster Mage, at this point, with Rest in Peace is just a 2 1. With a repeal, you can kind of time it. But yeah, I kind of like this, just dealing with the board. Th there is um, definitely a debate f with Snapcaster Mage and just one goblin to not bother. Uh, animating the colonnade here just to prevent Huey from comboing off. But it seems like Steven has access to both Dispel and Negate, so I think this is a very safe activation. Get Control the board, take up the ferry, and take over the game. Yeah, and that's how it looks right here. So there's an opt. The most dangerous card to see resolve at this point would be a Blood Moon, but Steven is pretty 
um, safe from it. And with 10 minutes on the clock and Huey up a game, uh, I believe Steven will be able to lock down this game too, so I wouldn't be surprised if we move to a game free soon-ish. Um, this is actually pretty bad for the Just Sky players team since they're already down a match and they'll need game free to finish, which is not that easy in this limited amount of time. Here we see a gift son given from, Reed Je uh, from William Jensen. At the end. Reed Jensen, what a, what a, like the Simic players. Uh, dream combo. Right, you're a Momir big fan. <laughs> I am too, but uh, just for Momir basic. <laughs> All right. Well, Negate took care of that gift's ungiven. Yeah, this is going to take some time. Uh, I could kind of like to see Steven start jamming in. The colonnade? Yeah, we, we need to finish. We need to close this game down. Uh, you could have this turn not involve the colonnade since uh, Huey's at exactly 14, so... One attack from Snapcaster, 12. Then Colony plus Snapcaster twice. Six and six lethal damage. Uh, if you have Lightning Bolt, then it makes sense, though, to animate the Colonnade. But yeah, it just looks like Steven has access to lots of counter magic here. Well, it looks like he's on your clock. Goes Snapcaster Mage down to 12. And then has two turns to just finish things off if Huey has nothing. Yeah, I think that, that clock is fine. You just, just have to close the game. Well, that's not the clock he has to be worried about. Again, eight minutes and a half left in the feature match area. Right, and that's part of why Huey's not casting Baral. Yeah. And, and, and that, you know, that's, that's why Huey is essentially not, not conceding here is your opponent has to go for the actions, and Huey definitely has time to win a game free. I'm not so sure for Steven. So yeah, Steven is the one under pressure. And because of that, Huey knows that, well, Steven's going to have to tap some mana here in it to attack, which is good for me since that means that my opponent is going to tap low against my combo. Can I kind tell, of... Can yeah. tell you, we, we may very well see a game three here uh, because it sounds like uh, Owen is up against it in his game three against Charles Cap, and things are looking a little grim for him. Yeah. Is what I'm hearing. There's Baral, Chief of Compliance. Yeah. But. Yeah, Ugin and Endbringer in play for Owen's opponent. Owen's on seven. So. Yeah. Here, I kind of like would have liked Steven to uh, tap more of those non basics. The reason for that is you don't actually know if a Blood Moon could come down. Sure. Uh, and then you could be facing your opponent with no ac access to almost no blue mana. All right, here's a Metamorphose from H Jensen. That's going to get dispelled. Owen did just lose, by the way, so uh, we're going to see a game three here. Here's an empty the Warrens. Right, and Huey here could have played another um, um, ritual, in Desperate Ritual, but decides uh, if my opponent has Negate, then that's my turn. I think there's enough spells to make this empty the Warrens pretty good. Yeah, so. even with the logic not. <laughs> <laughs> He's I have like these a, six. Okay, I have these four. Yeah. Right, so here, um, I mean, it's fine. You just attack with Colonnade twice in the air. You might draw a Bolt and, yeah. But it, it's looking, yeah, with Charles winning the, the game, it's looking like it's all down to Huey to take down game free. And his, his deck is capable of a very quick win. Yeah, Storm has one huge advantage in tournaments. When you get told, yeah, you, you have it's time on the round. You have access to this many additional turns, and your plan is to just win in additional turns. You know, I mean, I mean, a big turn. Then your deck is advantaged when going uh, to time. Those games were long, though. That's this is what happens, right? When you play uh, combo versus control, your game one is usually not too slow, but game two can be a grind fest, and then game three usually favors the combo opponent as a result. There you get a look in the feature match area as. Uh the players huddle around this middle table for William Jensen's game three. It, it looks like both teams were kind of letting their uh, players play out. They, it, it looked like there was minimal involvement. Uh, the way it's interesting to actually get the wide shot and see how they communicate. I've, I think that since Jeskai is quite a known deck, um, neither Owen or Reed are intervening. They're just watching. Uh, just because they know that their teammate will understand how this matchup plays out. 
I think they would only intervene in a case like this where Huey is unsure about a decision and asks advice um, rather than the reverse. Owen will, or Reed would rarely intervene in Huey's decision-making process, but uh, Huey may decide to call upon them, kind of phone a friend, right? Yeah. <laughs> And I, and I feel that that's, like, one of the better ways to communicate as a team is, you know, you play your own game, but if you need help, you ask, um, trying to provide the right information to your teammate. There you see Andy Cooperfiles putting down a clock to make sure these players know how much time they have in the round. Uh, the feature match area often runs on an independent clock from the main event because sometimes they're ready sooner, later, at different times. They still get the same amount of time as everyone else, but it is run on an independent clock, and that's the clock we show you uh, on screen here. Right, I mean, you, you want to keep things fair for everybody, right? Everybody gets their 50 minutes before they, they lead to a draw. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a, a draw is obviously uh, not great. Uh, at, in a team tournament, especially, it is more likely to happen, though, with free matches, people that can get involved in each other's games. Uh, you get into scenarios where it's more off. You more often than not will have unintentional draws. G give me a scenario where Stephen Morrison's deck can win in the three minutes and forty-five seconds left in this round. Huey goes for a big play. It fails, and Seaman goes bolt snap bolt bolt snap bolt. Okay, something like that <laughs> along these lines. All right. Well, we're underway here. Steam Vents is the opening play for William Jensen. Scalding Tarn, a zero casting cost, engineered explosives. There's Pyromancer Ascension for William Jensen. Yeah, but Steven with the perfect answer in hand, rest in peace. Oh, boy. Pyromancer Ascension can't trigger with rest in peace, having no cards in. I mean, I mean, rest in peace has to come down before you get to that second counter uh, for Pyromancer's Ascension. When, once the Pyromancer's Ascension has two counters, Rest in Peace does nothing to, to prevent it. Uh, so, yeah, you, if you get the Rest in Peace down before, though, it's fine. Now, how can William Jensen win through a Rest in Peace if that comes up? Attention An easy way, uh, make a bunch of rituals and a quick Blood Moon and lock your opponent out. The, the game doesn't have much time, so you would have to follow that up with a big Empty the Warrants. But if you have a Blood Moon lock, then... You know, you, you can kill your opponent with relatively few goblins. The other line, line of attack uh, here would be just that empty the warrants for quite a few goblins, like say 10 or 12. But with that engineered explosives in play, and I believe a supreme verdict in hand. Oh boy. I, I, I think so. It may not be though, but the engineered explosives is already enough. But again, worth noting that it's not enough for Steven to win this match. It, it may only be enough for him to draw. Here's Baral, Chief of Compliance. Yeah, uh, Steven decided to get Hallowed Fountain, and that decision took a while. I think that was a genuine difficult decision because it looks like Steven doesn't have access to a third land. So Steven was trying to consider, do I get Hallowed Fountain or <laughs> Sacred Foundry? <laughs> and, Sacred and Foundry may be better. Yeah, the Baral beats her. Baral beat down. Well, it's, uh, Baral, I, I, Chief of Compliance, whenever spell ability, jerk control, blah, blah, blah. Attack for one. <laughs> attack for one. It's one free. <laughs> I'm trying to maritime guard, I think, is the <laughs> what it is. I mean, yeah. Baral was like a really key card for these storm decks. It allowed them to go past the limited number of four on Goblin Electromancer, and often is better than Goblin Electromancer, although it's a legendary creature, just because of that additional filtering ability allowing you to run Remand at a profit, plus the the fact that it's you know it doesn't require red mana. All right, here we see uh, Morrison going for Field of Ruin. This is going to find him a red mana that he wants. And now we see Jensen going for Gifts Ungiven in response. And, and we have limited time. So Huey is going to set up for that turn four, or turn five. And it looks like the answer to that is I actually have time to fire off another one of the Gifts Ungiven. So I'm going to put my opponent in a tough spot where I ever get value in this like counter magic to protect myself with a spell of Romanda or I get value with gifts I'm given in Grape Shot. He's gonna give him Remand and Gifts Ungiven. And there you see Jensen searching up an island off the field of ruin. And we're gonna see a mountain 
We're, we're going to be going to time here in a minute. Again, Jensen only needs one big turn. Morrison, he cannot win this match. Not at this point. We're there's, there's yeah. all, you know, he, he, you know, you talked about the idea of how many bolts he would need to fire off at Jensen in order to win. He just doesn't have enough red mana for it. Yeah, and now time is called. So it means that since we're time on the round here, Huey would have turns two and four, which is definitely worse. Um, which, which is why you saw Huey get that grape shot. Is I don't. I think Huey realizes that empty the warrens would be too slow. He's just gonna dispel the bolt. He's like, nope. Yep, that's correct. Just he gets to draw and discard, and I imagine we're gonna see Past in Flames get the heck out of William Jensen's hand, loots it away with Baral. Right. It's a lot harder for the Storm deck to go off with a Rest in Peace in play because your loops are not deterministic. Uh, normally, and, and what I mean by that is, normally you cast a bunch of Rituals, cast Past in Flame with Gifts, and there's no way you can, you know, so to speak, fail to combo since you're gonna get enough critical mass. But without Rest in Peace, you don't have access to Pass in Flames. Without Pass in Flames, guaranteeing that critical mass is not really possible. All right, here's another bolt from Morrison. Again, hasn't played a second red source, so Remand could be a, not serve, let's call it a firm counter, not a hard counter. Right, so, so here you ask yourself the question, do I burn the Remand on this bolt because if my opponent has red mana, yeah. Here he says no. I mean, it's very unlikely for Huey to win from this position either. I've, the most natural conclusion of this match is that we're going towards uh, a draw. Pyromancer Ascension, a dead card. Um, empty the Warrens, essentially a dead card for that Engineered Explosives on zero. Yeah, I mean, Huey's just going to pass a turn. Aim to cast at Gifts Ungiven. Uh, probably get it countered if if I uh, saw Steven's hand All right. correctly. Gifts Ungiven is the play. I mean, you would probably counter this. <coughs> you know your opponent can't really remand here, so... It, it turns out that remanding the bolt would have been actually pretty good for Huey, but it's really hard to tell at the time. Like, we have actual information on the hands, and that's not clear. All yeah. right, Dispel counters gifts and given okay so this is turn four this is william jensen's last turn of this match can he assemble something here some sort of combo that'll let him grape shot his opponent out well, well with reman and grape shot the the most likely play that would have happened had baral survived is baral grape shot remand my own grape shot and then you get to have more storm essentially the the original grape shot gets remanded but all the storm copies still go on the stack um so that, that was essentially uh, the line we were going for, but here I don't think we can get there uh, just because we don't have mana production, which would have been necessary. Oh, there's a second mana morphos. Actually, if we draw a Baral or Electromancer, maybe. All right. William Jensen's like, if you're going to help me with this opt, I will, I will gladly accept your gift of storm. So here comes a mana morphos. Which is going to also draw Jensen a card. Yeah, we had blue-red, and we tried to hit Baral or Goblin Electromancer. Well, there's another ritual. Well, at that point, you're, you, I mean, you can't really remand your own spell now. Because right. if you do so, you have no mana. You, you really need to keep those remands for later. Um, which kind of means that if you can't use a remand, I mean, that leaves you with that last mana morphos in hand. So I guess you would have to do that. The other angle you could do is fire that Desperate Ritual now with the aim of filtering the red mana through the mana morphos. Um, I mean, at this point, Huey is... I mean, the game could have developed. I'm not sure who would have won, but Huey is essentially aiming for the highest percentage from something that is below five. There's a Goblin Electromancer. Right. Well, that's the card we were looking for. Uh, Baral would have been actually the card um, Huey was looking for since sort of with those remands would have allowed some filtering action but we'll take what we have but let's see um, I'm trying to follow this turn completely I don't think Huey played a land so I, I don't believe he has so we play Electromancer here that leaves us with a desperate ritual for free red 
and then you can grape shot and remand that. Let's see. So Storm is at four. So desperate five. Well, Electromancer five. Great. Uh, desperate ritual six. Then you get to seven with the grape shot. Only six resolve because you remand that eight. Then you grape shot again nine. So that'd be fifteen, unless I miscounted, which is quite possible here. Uh, but then you draw a card from Remand. So I think we're down to... All right, here is Grape Shot. Right, so there's Storm is 7, but only 6 copies will resolve, putting Steven to 11. And at this point... And then you see the other, the other players are contributing to this discussion. Yeah. So here you remand the original Grape Shot. So Steven would go to 11. You remand the Grape Shot. That allows you to draw a card. Uh, then you go to Storm 8. Then Grape Shot would be Storm 9. But you don't have access to blue mana, so so I, Huey definitely needs to draw something. Uh, either a, a ritual may not be enough, since you would be actually short exactly one point of damage. Well, the remand definitely. Yeah, yeah, the remand be, goes. The remand's gone. The remand's exiled. Gone. So yeah, Stevens at eleven, and we wow. need something here. Baral, that would have been good earlier. That would have been. You know, being able to filter... If we had Baral into Electromancer, that would have been an additional card. Yeah, you get to the Grave Shot, your opponent down to two. Oh. And that's it. Yep, it's a draw. But yeah, I like that Huey went for, for the line, drew the Electromancer at the turn that was needed, and just needed one more draw. It was still yeah, unlikely. He had another Remand in hand too, right? Yeah, but no blue mana. But if he had drawn an island... Uh, had he, I don't think he played a land that turn, so yeah, an island yeah. would have also done it, yes. Wow, that was crazy. Uh, there we see, and, and to give you an idea, you know, we talked about how earlier the teammates were just letting Huey do his thing. You saw in those last turns, there was a lot of conferencing right. to give you an idea of how, how difficult that deck is to navigate. Right, but that, that, that was a bit different, right? Huey basically in that position was relatively sure of the line. It was double checking it, I believe, yeah. with his teammates. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, re really fun to watch. William Huey Jensen try to navigate out from an engineered explosives on zero and a rest in peace that just cut off huge swaths of what his deck was trying to do. Still almost got there, but uh, the match ends in a draw for Peach Garden Oath and uh, their opponents this round here in round two. Uh, we got some uh, brief messages, and then we're gonna be back with even more magic here from Grand Prix Detroit. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back to the booth here, round two of Grand Prix Detroit. Uh, we don't have a ton of time. They're, they're, we're waiting for the last couple matches to get in. We're going to see how much of our time walk match we can watch. Uh, we're going to pick things up here in game two between Tiago Saparito and Michael Papkin. Uh, let's go down to the feature match area and see how this plays out. Uh, we're picking things up. You can see Salvato, Hayne, and Saparito all oh, up yes. in game. So excited about this. As foretold, living end. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. So what, how does this deck work? Well, it's not the greatest against humans, right? Like <laughs> Nothing is, apparently. Well, specifically here, right? So the plan of the as foretold uh, deck is essentially cast a card as foretold, and then you get to play a bunch of cards that cost zero mana for free that are very powerful, such as Ancestral Visions and Living End. You, however, to give you an idea of why this matchup's bad, that card in play in Meddling Mage. The thing is, Meddling Mage was specifically, Mark Rosar specifically said they did not put Meddling Mage as a, um, I guess, time walk, time shifted card, because it hurts to spend cards too much. <laughs> and you can see that I play between Meddling Mage and both Ancestral Visions and Living End. So you can kind of see that working out. But yeah, a combination of Meddling Mage and Kite Self Freebooter make this matchup really, really hard for the As Foretold Living End deck. And because there's been a lot of humans in the modern metagame, that's why you haven't seen this deck that was kind of you. It didn't get developed more because of this matchup. And you see uh, Papkin remanding a Eighth of Isle just to draw a card. Uh, no, no problem for uh, Saparito. It essentially becomes a four spike. You can just pay <laughs> and yeah. replay it. Yeah, here, by the way, the Leyland of the Void in Michael's hand was probably an ambitious call. The idea of it would be once you destroy your opponent's board, you don't want the creatures to come back off the, a second living end. Ah. Uh, but I think that's probably unnecessary. If you're firing two living ends and you have access to Cryptic Commands, I think the game gets to a state where you don't need the card, uh, Leyland of the Void. But yeah, here, as foretold, doesn't, unf unfortunately doesn't have support, but uh, Tiago's hand is not very fast. So I kind of like just playing it here. I assume Ancestral Visions is name off Medley Mage. Well, here we see, you know, uh, a Phantasmal Image coming in play off of the Aether Vial. Excellent recognition from Tiago. You want to respond to this, respond to this as foretold? Either, I'm not sure what the Medley, name, Medley Mage is naming, but if it names whichever one of Living End or Ancestral Vision, you want to name the other, or you can Kite Self Freebooter to have more options. All right. Gets the first vial up to three, second vial up to one. Again, this humans deck has become. Uh, boy, if you you are coming to this tournament and you don't have a plan for humans, you should be looking at the side event schedule. <laughs> <laughs> that is really harsh. No, I mean, right? <laughs> I mean, that's this is the deck you know you're going to face almost every round. Somebody on a team will most certainly be playing humans. Right, and the, and the reason is the specific format, Team Unified Modern. It requires two things. One, it requires uh, you know, two teammates. So those teammates have to accept what modern deck you're going to play. And they're probably going to want you to play good ones. Yeah, here Medley Mage on Ancestral Visions. Can't cast it, stays exiled forever. Really clean and, dis and kind of disgusting answer to the card. <laughs> but also because the human deck, it plays a ton of cards that nobody else is going to play. Noble Hierarch is really deep and canopy are only the kind of only cards our decks would be interested in. Vile, maybe. So at the so you end up playing humans because it works so well in a unified format. It you can play it and play whatever else really you want as the other two decks. And a lot of people have a had as their favorite deck combination. You know, humans, an ancient stirrings deck, and I would say that it should be KCI if you're a very competent pilot. And if you're not, I really like the hard enough uh, scales affinity deck that uh, Riley actually highlighted a little before, and I think is a great choice if you're not a, the best. Clark Clan Ironworks pilot. Um, and then the third deck is whatever floats your boat, really. <laughs> but UI control, Jeskai control, kind of. I, think that I was just going to say, if yeah. you're the, if that's usually reserved for the grindy or control player, right? Right. So I think that's like the combination that would be seen as like the tier zero or tier one combination. The one you should expect. Humans, some form of ancient stirring deck, either KCI or hardened skills, both of which would be weak to cards like Stony Silence, or and the control deck. Blue White Control or Jeskai. You would usually favor Jeskai if you're trying to beat the Blue White Control mirrors. Uh, and I think Jeskai might be a good option over Blue White. Blue White probably better against the field at large, but against the specialist field involving most likely a creature deck like humans, 
Um, as well as uh, these kind of blue-white mirrors, I kind of favor Jeskai because you're stronger in the, in the matchup you think you're going to face a ton of. Here we see Michael Papkin again, basically cycling his counter spells uh, to draw cards. Yeah. I mean, Cryptic Command has, like, the, one of the reasons it's such a powerful card is exactly that, is you, you get either, I mean, against Storm, we kind of saw the, the, the stack interruption, right? Like, disrupt your creature in play, uh, counter your spell. While here we saw the board control interaction, you know, tap your creatures, draw a card. So the fact that you can act it as, you know, fog, draw a card, you know, prevent all damage, uh, card advantage, that, that's what made Cryptic so good. The fact that it was legal in a standard <laughs> set, my lord, that was, a that was a powerful standard format. Yeah, Teleria West is the uh, play here and not putting that land into play. He's actually using the transmutability, so he gets to go find a card that costs zero. I which love, is I love, a I love, land yeah. or maybe many of his um, suspend cards. I, I love this interaction. You see that Badruga Bog in play? That's what Tolera West allows. It allows you to get one of those key pieces in Living End, Ancestral Visions, or get a utility land like Badruga Bog. And just playing two or three Tolera West multiplies that one copy into many more. Uh, we often see these uh, Ask for Toll decks trying to develop a third color. Michael deciding to go for red. Uh, here, I guess the option of a raid being quite an allure. It's going to, yep, target that Phantasmal image. It's going to unlock a card that was locked beneath it. But I'm, I'm going to suspect that that was Living End. Yeah. So oh. Here we see a One, two, three, mage four, five, yeah. six, seven, eight, nine. We're, we're, I'm already counting above Michael's life toll. Michael's tapped out. They do play Slaughter Pack, but Michael doesn't have it. And there's the hand. So Tiago Saparito uh, gets the first match for his team. They're up a game all the way across the board. And I can tell you that Luis Salvato does advance here to uh, his team to 2-0. Uh, they, they did take down the match. And, uh, you know. Excellent. Things proceeding Moving according on. to plan Moving on. <laughs> for Luis Salvato. I'm sure we're going to see more of him over this weekend. Uh, we've got some brief messages and then we're going to be back with round three here at Grand Prix Detroit. Don't go anywhere. Your game with Ultra Pro Magic the Gathering accessories. 